May I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In a single week, back in 2007, Johnny and I got engaged. I celebrated my 29th birthday, and my grandmother died. My grandma actually died on my birthday. To say it was an emotional week is an understatement. <laughs> My granny was in her 80s. She had had a very long career as a teacher. She was the first person in her family to go to university. She played piano and organ at her church. She was a deacon at her church. She sang in a choir. She taught music to children long into her retirement. She had six children, 13 grandchildren, and at the time of her death, two great-grandchildren. She was a true matriarch, and she regularly gathered her large family together in her home where she served a million different kinds of dessert, and she always had that kind of whipped cream that you squirt from a can. <laughs> the week before my grandmother died, my mother and one of her brothers were with Granny. And Granny said that she wanted to talk to them about her funeral. She told them the hymns and the scriptures that she had chosen. She told them who she wanted to preach the sermon, everything that she had planned. And then she asked them to pray with her. A few days later, she suffered sudden and unexpected heart failure and died peacefully in her daughter's arms. My grandma's funeral was one of those funerals that is truly a celebration of life. The whole large family were all gathered for one last time in her house. And I remember looking around that room that day and thinking, every single person here owes their life or the life of their partner and children to this woman. At that funeral, we cried, but we also laughed a lot. My grandma had a good death. She had lived a long life. It was not a life without pain. Her first husband died suddenly when he was young. Her youngest child was born brain damaged and needed lifelong care. She struggled with complicated health problems. But ultimately, she had a good life. My grandma was a remarkable woman. She lived a long life and she had a good death. Today, we, com we commemorate the Feast of All Saints, also known as the Day of the Dead. It is an opportunity for all of us to remember our loved ones who have died, to tell their stories, and to trust that they are kept safe in God's love. And our scriptures today paint a picture of an extravagant feast prepared on a heavenly mountain for those who are beloved of God. Today's scriptures tell us, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And we are told that those beloved of God shall receive a just reward from the God of their salvation. Elsewhere, in a similar text... Our scriptures tell us that we here now are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. These are the saints who have gone before us. And we're encouraged that because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we should run the race of life with perseverance in the time that we ourselves have on earth. And All Saints Day is about that cloud of witnesses. 
the great crowd cheering us on as we run the race of life every day. And if we imagine that we're runners on a track running a race and you look up and you see the crowd around you cheering you on, in that crowd, maybe we can see familiar faces, the faces of those that we love who have died. It is not unchristian to imagine that the people we have loved and lost are standing close to us. The Bible sometimes seems to imply that the curtain between earth and heaven is thinner than we are sometimes comfortable thinking about. And when I think about my grandmother, it is very easy for me to take comfort in this Christian imagery of running a good race, having a long life and a good death, and enjoying a great heavenly feast. But what about all the people for whom that is a more difficult image? What about all the people who don't get the privilege of a long life and a good death? What about those for whom life is short and cruel? I think of my cousin-in-law, whose baby daughter died suddenly in her sleep just before her second birthday. What about a mom who dies of cancer when her kids are still young and never gets to see them grow up? What about those who struggle for years with painful physical or mental health problems that will eventually take their lives? What about indigenous children buried in unmarked graves? What about the children in Gaza and the unnumbered victims of war and poverty all around the world? Well, I don't actually think that running a good race necessarily means having a long and happy life and dying peacefully in our beds at a grand old age. We know that this will not happen for most people and that many people's lives are painful or are cut short in tragic ways. And these words that we heard this morning from Isaiah and from Revelation, they were not written to people who had access to 21st century health care and died peacefully in their beds. They were written to people who were traumatized and suffering. These are texts about about faith even in the face of death, of rebellious hope that one day suffering and tears and pain will be no more. We can take comfort in those words of hope. But we should be very wary of any interpretation of these texts that glorifies or excuses or minimizes the suffering of people today. Too often, over the centuries, suffering people have been told by comfortable, affluent Christians, you're suffering now, but you will get your reward in heaven one day, rather than us actually making changes to try to bring about justice and relief here and now. I wonder, what if to run a good race and throw off everything that hinders us actually means to throw off everything that hinders the communal us, everything that prevents human flourishing, to seek justice for those whose lives are stolen from them, to work for peace and bring an end to poverty and exploitation so that all may thrive and not have their lives cut short. We cannot defeat death, but we can work for a more just world. And I think that we can learn an important lesson from our Jewish siblings, the power of telling stories, of remembering people, of speaking their names when we gather together in sacred spaces and in everyday ones. There is power in remembering. The Hebrew scriptures tell the stories of the heroes of our faith of all genders, 
beginning with Genesis and going all the way through the history of the Jewish people, naming Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Joseph, Moses, Ruth, Rahab, David, and many others. Each year celebrating Passover, the Jewish people would retell the Exodus story, the story of how they came from slavery into freedom. And at Purim, they would tell the story of Esther and how she saved her people. These are stories of a shared history, stories of the ancestors, those who have come before, those who make the people who they are today. Many of their names and stories have been remembered, but many, many more remain nameless. And the same is true in our Christian history. When we learn church history, we tend to hear about Augustine and Aquinas, Luther and Calvin, and often on All Saints Day, we remember and we talk about those particular people that the church has declared as saints. The big famous names, the mostly Western, mostly white, mostly men, whose deeds and words have been written down and remembered. But there are millions of faithful heroes of our faith, of all genders across the globe, whose names the world does not remember. The world forgets those who are not prominent, but God does not forget. There are names that have been forgotten, but God remembers every one. So today, as we remember those we have loved and lost, let us pray. May God welcome the dead, comfort the living, bring justice to all people, and healing to our nations. Amen. <laughs>